Hello and welcome to this webinar, Less is More, the future of the global alcoholic bedfish industry from Leatherhead Food Research. Thank you all for listening in today. My name is Jenny Arthur, the Head of Nutrition and Membership, and I'm joined by Adam Fenton, the VP of Food and Beverage Consulting. Today, we're talking through some of the findings of our global study on the changing consumer sentiment to consumption of alcoholic drinks, which we undertook at the end of 2020. We hope you find these interesting and thought provoking. Firstly, I'd like to introduce you to Leatherhead Food Research for those of you who don't know us. Leatherhead Food Research is a membership organisation with over 300 global members in over a thousand locations worldwide. Amongst our members are 17 of the top 20 food and beverage companies. We've been operating for over 100 years since 1919, offering regulatory and technical support to the food and beverage industry. We cover over 150 markets worldwide with 20 native speakers located in the UK. I'm now going to hand back to Adam to go through the agenda for today. Thanks for the introduction, Jenny. And as you mentioned, we've undertaken a global study on the changing consumer attitudes to alternative drinks in the traditional alcoholic beverage industry. We surveyed around 10,000 people in Australia, France, Japan, Poland, South Africa, Spain, the UK and the US. And over the next half an hour or so, I'll cover off why natural is and will continue to be so important to consumers in the beverage industry and more specifically to manufacturers of alcoholic drinks. I'll address that being alcohol free is not the only choice for adult consumers that want an alternative to their usual drink. I shall elaborate on what the drivers of choice are in the adult drinks category and also why some drinks are struggling to gain traction in markets and this is relevant to manufacturers retailers and marketers. And the last group of particular importance is the communication around claims has an impact on maintaining levels of adult drinks. Firstly, I'll set the scene with an introduction, background and a reminder that some of our findings reflect consumer behaviour that was popular in the 1970s. Treated as a fad, it remains truly relevant in our current environment. I'll then move on to address the current consumer need for less of what they are drinking and go into details of our study with some key observations and a summary. Finally, you'll have an opportunity during the webinar to send in some questions that I hope either Jenny or I will be able to answer. So let me provide a little perspective of why we are here today. Some of you may remember the Atkins diet. Originating in the 1970s, this diet focused on the reduction of carbohydrates and the increased consumption of fats. This became very popular, firstly in the US, then globally in the late 1990s, and into the start of the, of the century with the net carb concept. At the same time that net carb concept was being introduced, and with beer in mind, Michelob Ultra was launched, targeting the over 50s with what some might call a diet beer. But the beer saw significant growth with 20 to 30 year olds and also captured the attention of female drinkers, something that brewers continually strive to achieve. Michelob Ultra has seen shifts in popularity since with innovative variations as well as sponsorship of sports events. But the beer emphasizes that whilst people aspire to look healthier, to feel healthier and to be healthier, consumers still do want a beer, a wine, a cocktail or a spirit. And currently they want a drink, ideally with the same flavour and sensory cues, but with something less. And that's typically either alcohol and or carbohydrates. Dropping carbohydrates or alcohol whilst retaining a comparable sensory experience continues to provide a challenge for not just product development teams, but also marketeers looking to clearly label and communicate the trade-off between taste and the apparent healthier alternative. I'll hand back to Jenny to address the relationship with health and wellness. 
Okay, thank you, Adam. So looking at the relationship between health and wellness. Health and wellness is a key consideration for many food and beverage manufacturers and consumers. As a healthy lifestyle, including a balanced diet and physical activity can have a profound effect on physical and mental well-being. This has become even more relevant during the COVID-19 pandemic as consumers and even younger consumers not previously interested in the health agenda are becoming more aware of preventative nutrition, for example, by boosting their immune system through food, drinks and supplements. One of the major challenges for the alcoholic drinks industry is that alcohol is deemed more damaging to health than any of the benefits that it may bring from drinking in moderation. From a health perspective, in 2016, the government's alcohol guidelines in the UK were reviewed and reduced consumption levels from 21 units a week for men to 14 units a week for both men and women. That's the equivalent of six pints of beer or 10 small glasses of wine per week. Consumers are becoming more aware of the health implications of drinking alcohol. And as a result, between 2004 and 2017, alcohol consumption reduced by 16%. In 2017, 45 to 64 year olds were the most likely to drink and 16 to 24 year olds the least likely to drink. This trend is reflected in many countries around the world and looks set to continue. As we show in our report, consumers tended to focus on liver health and weight. However, they are also more aware of the impact of alcohol on their physical and mental health, from cancers and heart disease to physical appearance and mental wellness. The alcohol industry needs to change its game plan more quickly to meet the demand from consumers looking for low and no alcohol alternatives and deliver against the health agenda. I will now hand back to Adam to take us through the research. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. Uh, the easiest option really for the industry um, is to either reduce the level of alcohol, reduce the level of calories, and of course, encourage responsible drinking and reduce total volume of alcohol consumed. These address the health agenda, and we explore these as well as the well-being agenda in the coming slides. There are numerous examples of where the reduction of alcohol, carbohydrates and calories are being used currently, including the wide acceptance of mainstream beers at 4% rather than 5% and the increase in lower and low alcohol drinks, as well as non-alcoholic and alcohol-free alternatives across all subcategories. Yungling Light is an example of a beer where the calories are labeled. We also have an example here of an Italian sparkling red wine at 7%, where the lower alcohol is counted with some carbonation from a taste perspective. Whilst there are guidelines of what constitutes lower, low and no, in alcoholic drinks, I do have a quiet word of warning for those interested. The tolerances in the measurement of the alcohol content will vary across different countries, so beware. These reduced alcohol drinks are joined by the likes of hard seltzers that retain the alcohol, often between four and 5%, and with clearly labeled levels of calories. There are also drinks that promote self-indulgence, but in smaller, more moderate volumes. An example here is Heyman's Small Gin, which is produced using elevated levels of botanicals and in turn reducing the amount required in a gin and tonic. There are indeed other alternatives in the grey area between carbonated soft drinks and traditional brewing and distillation. And these often go hand in hand with naturalness. Examples are kombucha and kefir. But it should be noted that these cause problems for large manufacturers from a scale-up perspective, as well as unwanted stability considerations. And as far as I'm aware, there is still no definition of what a kombucha actually is. Whilst all the above points refer to the reduction of alcohol, carbohydrates and calories, there has been a rise in drinks that use ingredients that are understood to promote well-being. Examples are lion's mane, valerian root, and Siberian ginseng. And again, a watch out for you. Some of these ingredients 
that are associated well with wellness are only allowed as food supplements or only part of the plant is allowed or they may be in the compendium of botanicals and listed as a health concern. Understandably, manufacturers are looking to offset the reduction of the good stuff with something more positively functional. These observations are reinforced by one of the overall messages from our global study. Products are addressing their primary need of less alcohol and or carbohydrates, but consumers are wanting more. They want more information about ingredients and process, as well as nutritional facts that are not mandatory on alcoholic beverages in some markets. Consumers want more variety as they look to change their habits. And in some countries, and arguably those less mature markets, there is a need for more accessibility. These consumer views are focused on being more mindful about themselves and the environment. Consumers associate this with naturalness and the benefit that might bring to physical health and mental wellness. These consumer needs apply across almost all categories of food and beverage. The tea industry, as an example, is primed to address the suboptimal health. And this is a term currently used in science, but making its way into the consumer awareness, either directly or indirectly. This is certainly something that the alcoholic drinks industry can take on and address. But what is suboptimal health from a drinks perspective? Well, health has a clear definition, and probably the best place to go to for this is the World Health Organization. A state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And by this definition, there is a grey area where individuals have symptoms of illness and without diagnosis of disease which is a topic of study for scientists and gaining interest though in FMCG and with the consumer. This is termed suboptimal health or subhealth, where there may be an underlying health issue or a combination of lesser issues such as stress, lack of sleep or exercise and poor diet. Medical treatment is not deemed necessary or relevant as disease is absent. Symptoms are clearly present. This is by no means a consumer trend yet, although it's clearly aligned with the wellness part of health and wellness, and sub-health captures an area of notable consumer interest. We may be early with this, but I believe that there is an opportunity for the alcoholic drinks industry to address a currently undefined consumer need that is real, but not yet fully understood. So whilst reducing the alcohol and calories in drinks, that when overconsumed impact the health part of health and wellness, there is an opportunity for the industry to launch more interesting and engaging products to enhance and promote the well-being aspect. With the history and context set, let me go on to our study where we found a number of interesting observations from our consumer base of around 10,000 people from across 10 countries. Five of these Five of these were that natural is the biggest driver for consumers when choosing an alternative to their usual alcoholic drink. This has an impact on both product development and what can and cannot be claimed on the side of your can or bottle. But whilst manufacturers strive to produce a 0.0, .0 ABV product, many consumers are still satisfied with low and lower. And this may be because of the compromise with taste and the reward or indulgence that an alcoholic product continues to provide. We find that many consumers are concerned about their physical appearance, possibly enhanced by nowadays regular video calls, and they're also becoming more self-aware. Of course, hard seltzers are clearly doing well, and this is reflected not just in your sales, but also in our study. The clear benefit of being able to label 95 calories or similar is certain to be a driver in choice, whereas communicating the merits of gut health from a kombucha, for example, remains a challenge. Importantly, we found that consumers need to be kept interested and informed. Unlike a beer in front of the TV or a wine at dinner, which play a secondary role, an alternative drink of choice is likely to be the centre of attention. I'll cover these points more thoroughly over the next 10 minutes. 
and the detailed findings are available if you register for the full report at the end. Our first point was about natural and being natural. Products need to offset the reduction in alcohol and carbs, and this appears to be done with natural claims. 25% of consumers in our study want more of these natural products available. South Africa and Poland chose natural ingredients as their leading need, with 42% of consumers in South Africa wanting more natural alternatives. And this is aligned with the fact that 29% of consumers across the whole study recently purchased a drink with natural ingredients, making that the biggest driver as an alternative to alcohol. Now this may be obvious, but the selection of ingredients need to not just taste great, but be natural and clearly labelled. As mentioned, the momentum is towards 0.0% ABV, with the likes of Heineken and Seedlip and now Gordon's leading the way. However, our study found that low alcoholic variants are purchased more often than non-alcoholic and alcohol-free variants. This is across all markets and independent of gender. And I speculate maybe down to a lack of understanding of the definitions of lower, low and no, as well as an underlying need for sensory experience and appreciation for flavour by the consumer. Ultimately, those consumers that do drink often wish to reduce but not abstain from drinking alcohol. This could be due to the nature of the drinking occasion, as well as the overall quality of the current alternatives. One of the reasons for reduction in consumption is that maintaining a healthy appearance is key in consumer's choice, as well as weight management and liver concerns. In five of the eight markets, weight management was the top reason to choose an alternative to their usual drink. Worryingly, although maybe a sign of today's times, the consumers in half of the markets chose physical appearance over liver function. I mentioned earlier that consumers are interested in the products. They're becoming increasingly self-aware, possibly down to the video calls that we have, where they spend more time looking at themselves than others. They're interested in, is in how they appear and how they are perceived with and without a drink in hand. And finally, whilst gut and mental health are clearly on the radar, there is less consumer interest in these topics, at least from the alcoholic drink perspective. These figures support the following observations in newer subcategories. Kombucha, kefir and CBD drinks have all been heavily scrutinized by manufacturers, but they are yet to be seriously considered as alternatives to alcohol. There is great variation as to their acceptance across markets, largely dependent on that market's maturity, and with CBD drinks, its legal status. My view here is that more mature markets have consumers willing to trust brands and their claims around gut health, as an example, even if they are not fully understood or proven for that matter. Conversely, the growth of hard seltzers is clear in all markets that it is available in. And this is partially down to the consumer's eye on weight management, as well as the clear benefit measured in calories on the front of that can. This demonstrates the value in a clear and proven message in the case of hard seltzers, and may also underpin the future growth of alcohol-free products. That said, and product aside, there are some key messages to consider and revolve around the fact that less than 25% of consumers are drinking less than they were last year. And as you might expect, those are the younger consumers. To put it another way, approximately 75% or more are drinking the same or more. To me, this doesn't signal the beginning of the end of the alcohol industry. Rather, it points to what is needed by the next generation of consumers. Japan is often considered one of the countries at the forefront of consumer innovation. Of the markets we studied, consumption of alcohol drinks remains the most consistent in Japan, where there is, firstly, much variety in products, secondly, plenty of information, and thirdly, they deliver products that generate interest, and all of which are readily available to consumers. Conversely, consumption dropped most in South Africa and Poland, 
where consumers expressed the need for more lower calorie alternatives, more natural ingredients, as well as making the products available. And therein lies the opportunity to grow by keeping, keeping the consumer informed and interested through credible innovation and clear communication. And so finally, and may I thank you for your time, I'll move on to our brief summary of our learnings. The immediate path appears set on reducing alcohol and carbohydrates. And this is clearly understood by consumers. This typically suits manufacturers, as in many cases, these products reduce excise and save cost. But consumers will need something more in the near future. Otherwise, we will end up with, well, well, just water. So my advice is to firstly make it natural, as this rightly or wrongly has associations with well-being. But please bear in mind that the natural ingredients need to be legal. Soon, though, natural may become commoditized and ingredients with clear benefits are the obvious progression. Rather than the typical cereals and fruits, I suggest you scan and select new ingredients such as botanicals, including roots and leaves. Secondly, consumers are satisfied but not necessarily delighted with lower and non-alc. Variants do not need to match their parent brand in taste. But please bear in mind that what constitutes alcohol-free and non-alcoholic drinks and the variation in the tolerance levels in different markets. Simply put, consumers are looking for something else. And low is growing significantly and we expect no to continue to follow, but it hasn't quite yet. And we're also expecting the functional ingredients to grow as well, but not at the expense of transparency and simplicity of the product. A third point is that there will still be plenty of room for the traditional choices of alcohol, where indulgence, reward or adult refreshment is required. Consumers will expect this of all traditional choices, as well as their healthier alternatives. Flavour is still a requirement, just down prioritised at the moment. The future will require healthy alternatives that deliver on flavour. And as I mentioned, some ingredients already being used in lower alk drinks are not permitted in many markets. The fourth point for me is that innovation needs to move much faster in what is often a slow moving industry. My watch out here is that developing products more quickly risks product quality issues as well as shelf life problems. And Leatherhead are already addressing these points in other food categories such as snacks and plant-based dairy, for example, with better scanning, selection, and screening of possible innovations. Finally, and outside of the beer, wine and spirits category, beverage and snack companies are struggling to meet functional requirements because of perceived price ceilings. I'd argue that this could be of less of a concern in the alcoholic drinks industry, where manufacturers sometimes struggle to justify premiumization queues. Here is an opportunity. Brewing and distilling expertise is high and consumers are primed for experiences that can tap into wellness, both social and physiological. Our industry is in a great position to meet the headwind of health and also benefit from the tailwind of well-being. So on that note, can I thank you very much for listening? Um, we're going to go on to some questions in a moment, but uh, there is a more detailed report that you can register for here at this address. So thank you very much and I, and I welcome any questions. Okay, so um, thank you very much for listening in. It's Adam here. Um, I've got a couple of questions and, and in fact, uh, one of them is very much around hard seltzers. Um, people are asking, hard seltzers are clearly popular and they feature quite uh, an extent in our webinar. One of the questions is, how's the bubble burst? And if it does, what will replace it? And look, to be honest, I, I think it's a great question. Uh, hard seltzers are certainly not my cup of tea, but they are popular. Well, aside from being labeled for calorie content, um, hard seltzers are actually refreshing and crisp. And that's one interesting point, because it takes the main taste claim from some lighter beers and ciders. 
Um, arts Arts has also appealed across genders, uh, and with that, appealed to the me mixed gender occasion. And with COVID, we're seeing more and more mixed gender occasions, uh, and a lot of them outside as well. Given that CARB claim, they do um, overperform on traditional RTDs, which are too often overly sweet and satiating, and, and in fact, some cases still overtly marketed at uh, and appeal to some young drinkers. Importantly, hard seltzers are attractive to, to manufacturers, given the nature of the product. <coughs> Brewers, spirit companies, wine and cider makers, as well as soft drinks companies, can quite easily produce hard seltzers. So, will the bubble burst? Personally, I think not, for all of the reasons I've just mentioned. Um, but the one thing I would like to bring up is that manufacturers will need to innovate. I suspect there'll be innovation around the use of the sweeteners that are currently available and used in, in hard seltzers. Uh, there's also uh, probably innovation spaces to be looked at with regard to flavors and the ingredients. Uh, they'll need to be a little bit more innovative and functional. Uh, and I noticed there is a question about what is functional. But there will be a consumer interest in flavors and ingredients, and they need to explore more about what's there. And interestingly, and COVID related maybe, uh, it's a format at the moment, hard seltzers, that are easy for the off trade. People are walking around, they're drinking outside of bars and pubs because they're closed. I have a suspicion that when bars are fully open again, we may see people drinking vodka lime sodas, either off tap or prepared from at the bar, whereas previously they might have drank a beer. I'm not entirely sure whether um, or what will replace hard seltzers when it next happens, but uh, there are a few botanicals that may be looked at. hope that addresses Adam. the question on the hard seltzers. Yes, Jenny, go on, please. Adam, right. I've had another question here. Can I ask you, uh, what do you think is going to happen with packaging in the future? We've had a few questions about um, packaging. Yeah, uh, and, and great. And, and to be honest, we didn't cover that off as much as we might have in this report. Um, it's less clear. Certainly, the environmental impact will continue. Um, there is continued focus on less and less PET, and, and of course, we want more recyclable packaging. COVID's created a bit of a problem there with regard to package, though. Uh, with the off-trade drinking that I mentioned above, uh, drinks are now going into small pack. Fortunately, these products are tending to go into cans, uh, better for the environment uh, from a transport perspective, certainly, as it takes less space than bottles. In most places, they're most e uh, more easily recyclable as well. Uh, I would say, though, uh, and this is a watch out and not necessarily consumer based, um, but there is an immediate problem from the drinks trade. Uh, sorry, for the drinks trade, um, and that's the sourcing of cans. They're not as available as you might think. So I don't dispute that sustainability will, will be an ongoing challenge and focus. Uh, but initially, there are going to be some challenges for smaller companies and startups may affect their costs from packaging in cans, uh, and also their ability to, to maintain quality offerings. Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we've got another one here. Right. How significant is organic? Do customers want organic or do they just want natural? I know that's a, that's a great question for the alcohol industry. Uh, in other categories, certainly I'd say that um, organic plays a, an important role. Um, and trumps natural. Um, so great to be, good to be natural, great to be organic. I think in the beer, wines and spirits industry, um, unfortunately, maybe people associate have the same associations with natural that they do with organic. Um, so whilst there are some nice organic beers, wines out there, I don't, I, it, it doesn't give you as much leverage uh, as you might think and, and, and that you see in other categories, Jenny. Okay. 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 Good, good. Okay. With the rise in consumer consciousness, do you believe there's an expected trade-off between ABV percentage and traditional tastes and flavours? Yeah. So, so my belief there is that consumers are just at the moment satisfied to drink a lower or non-alc product um, at the expense of some of the tastes that you might get and some of the experience. However, there are some really good examples of, of products that are coming out at lower or no alk, which are tasting good. Um, I, had a, uh, I had a beer the other day, I think it was from Northern Monk, which was 0.0. .0. It was a stout, and you'd expect that to be thin 
and not so great, but I thought it was particularly good. Uh, you've got three spirits, which do a great job of providing some really good uh, taste characteristics from a, from a spirit perspective. Um, and whilst at the moment consumers are, are kind of okay, they're satisfied-ish with no and low alk offerings, they're going to expect more. And one of the reasons being is um, I think technology and the understanding of, of flavor and taste is increasing. Um, I think as well that consumer expectation is you don't actually have to match the parent brand. Uh, you know, if, if you're producing a beer, you don't have to produce the 5% taste with a 0.0% uh, beverage. And, and, you know, I've got a couple of good examples that I might talk about later um, if you want. Okay, lovely. And, and sort of going on from on from that theme, um, oh, taking into consideration no and low alcohol trend in spirits, how how is the functional benefit benefit relevant in this kind of innovation? Well, it depends what you call the, the functional uh, benefit here. Um, certainly, uh, alcohol has a functional aspect to it. Um, benefit maybe not in some cases, uh, but people are bringing in. Uh, different botanicals, different uh, different ingredients to provide some element of maybe mental alertness. Um, uh, so you can still enjoy that social uh, moment where you're having a drink, just maybe not uh, not the same impact that alcohol have. So you know where we have those those drinks. Of course, you can't with alcohol claim any um, any health benefits per se. Um, but really anything that's added and um, which may help or be functional theanine, uh, sorry, tea, for example, with its theanine content, um, consumers will associate that. And I think it adds interest. And I think that's the most important thing uh, with some of these adult alternatives for drinks. Um, they don't play a secondary role uh, that, a, that a beer might play when you're watching the football. And I, and I don't mean to be generic here, but uh, or a wine at the table. Often they play a more leading role in, in a conversation or an occasion. And that's where people really will start to have uh, want to have a more interesting product, um, both to, I suppose, demonstrate a little bit of knowledge, um, but also it's a, a talking point. Um, people are talking a lot more. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I had um, another one. I'm not sure if not sure if you're going to be able to answer this one. Or you might want to take it away. Oh, do you see the TTB revising some regulations to to allow new ingredients like healthy botanicals uh, to be used in low alcohol products? Um, oh, that's a difficult one. Um, Honestly, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it, certainly, it, was, it would be something that sh should be being done, but that's my personal view. Um, I can't... Um, I'd like to see it, certainly, and I think it should be done, but I, really, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that it would happen. Okay. Okay. Let me carry on going down. Um... Johnny, I, I've picked one <laughs> up here. This is, this okay. is more around the health side of things, if, if, if that's all right with you. Um, I mean, it, it's more generic, and, and I've picked up a few here, but uh, there's the, a question around, um, a, a personal question. Do you think that the trend towards drinking less alcohol, do you think that will continue? Yes, I, I do. I think um, consumers are becoming increasingly health conscious and, and looking for products with had added health benefits. And someone was asking about the trends about um, – uh, you know the trends following sort of covid covid 19 um we're seeing young consumers who are interest increasingly interested in the health agenda uh, looking for low alcohol and no alcohol alternatives and i think calories are going to continue to be the focus um because of the government's uh, calorie reduction program so i think it's going to be in sort of the forefront of consumers minds so yes i do think it will Okay. Okay. Uh, and again, a few questions here, but around this kind of idea, from a health perspective, what what do you think consumers are looking for from from these drinks? Okay. Well, consumers are primarily always it's always about taste. That's what they're looking for. But they're also looking for ingredients with added health benefits and functional ingredients. 
And from your, from the research that you presented, it's also about the availability of the products as well. Consumers are looking for choice um, dependent on the on the drinking occasion. Yeah, and I'd, I'd tend to agree with that as well. Um, OK, I did, Jenny, I, I've just picked one up and, and everyone, thanks very much for sending in your questions. Um, I, I, I'm going to answer one of these questions myself. It's around THC uh, in cannabis drinks. Um, so, uh, you know, the question is, what, what are our thoughts on THC? Uh, and for those of you that aren't aware, THC is the psychoactive piece of, of cannabis and cannabis drinks. Um, we didn't ask, I must say in our survey, we did not ask about THC. Uh, we asked about CBD. Uh, and of course, the nature of cannabis is that THC is, is largely the psychoactive piece, um, which many, many people will avoid when they're combining with um, alcohol. Um, does it give you no hangover? I don't know. And, and this is one of the things I'd like to say on the CBD and THC and cannabis uh, overall is that there are many claims and I'm not too sure many are substantiated. Uh, there are many unknowns. Um, and particularly uh, in contrast with alcohol, people um, know what impact alcohol may have on, on health. That's quite clear um, with, with some of the cannabis uh, derivatives, CBD and THC. Those are not as well known uh, as they might be. Uh, and particularly for adults who have been drinking and consuming alcohol for, for a large portion of their adulthood, for them to start, I suppose, brand new on CBD or THC for that matter, they won't really know how to, or how their body uh, or mind for that matter will, will cope with those products. It's an interesting, um, it's an interesting area certainly, um, and a bit of a minefield, it must be said. Uh, and I don't think it's just a question about legalization. Uh, a lot more needs to be done about that. Sorry. Okay, I've got another one, Adam, here. Um, do you see the occasions for indulgence as continuing the premonization trend of the past couple of years? Yeah, good question. Um, so indulgence, yeah, certainly, and particularly around uh, at the moment, um, people do like to indulge. And, and just to make sure we're talking about indulgence and the same thing, a self-treat. We're not talking overindulgence. Uh, for example. Um, yeah, indulgence um, as it is one of the premiumization um, platforms, I suppose, I'd, I'd look at and call. Uh, people will like to treat themselves. It's um, a difficult period at the moment with regard to COVID, etc. Um, there's also, well, there will also be the opportunity, I hope, in the, in the near future uh, to look at premiumization through, through more of a celebratory mindset and, and focus but um, a little bit of indulgence will go a long way just at the moment. Um, as I said there's a question about self-education and, and showing people um, that you're knowledgeable about product as well. Um, so whether it's a, a spirit, whether it's a wine, whether it's a beer, um, uh, you know some of those awkward moments when you're on a Zoom call or a Teams call and you're having a beer with your friends, there's an aspect of showing off. So for me, there's the indulgence piece for premiumization. There will be, I hope, some celebratory moments. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, demonstrating you, you're a bit of a know-it-all with regard to your drinks, uh, I think are pretty important on premiumization. Okay, lovely, lovely. Thank you for that. Um, are consumers prepared to pay more for natural, for natural and innovation, do you think? Um, I, I think they could do. They're not at the moment. Um, but I think that will come, um, particularly in the in the alcoholic drinks industry. There's been pushes at it, and uh, unfortunately, sometimes they fail. Uh, and my knowledge of the drinks industry is that occasionally um, companies will go back into their core business and, and focus on that for growth. I believe that for some of that growth, um, a little little bit more of an innovative mindset uh, will 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 be needed. Uh, and a bit of perseverance as well. So and at some point, consumers will have more disposable income. They will want to treat themselves. And back to that original point about premiumization, they will want to indulge or uh, show their knowledge. So they will be, um, I think they will be happy to, to go buy that extra special beer um, uh, or go and buy that, uh, the, the more indulgent spirits. Um, I, you know, they'll be more picky and choosy about what, what they buy. And, and with that in mind, they'll, they'll be able to spend a little bit more money on it as well. Okay, okay. Another question here. 
in the study, did you address or observe trends um, from dairy to non-dairy in um, RTDs? So, so the quick answer to that is uh, in the study, no, we didn't. Um, we didn't look at the, the dairy, um, but we do have a little bit of insight on that. Um, it's quite it's quite an interesting area. Um, and one thing I would pull out from that is a, a little bit of a comparison between some of the probiotic dairy products um, with kombucha. Now, one of the struggles I believe that kombucha has is that whilst it, for some people, tastes great, um, too, many, too many companies will be focusing on the, the probiotic piece um, with kombucha. And actually, uh, the insight that I have is that really if people are going to go probiotic then they'll tend to go to one of the probiotic dairy products than they will for for a kombucha um for that for that the learning for me is that hey look if, if you're looking at kombucha um focus on its as i mentioned earlier its naturalness um and some of its taste uh, and complexity and in most cases having a, a, a very low alcoholic content if if present at all Okay, interesting, interesting. So we've re we've received some questions about adjacencies from other categories. Could could you elaborate on that for me? Um, yeah, I mean, look, this is where people will tend to look for for innovation. Um, it's clear for me that botanicals will will play an important role for, in in the beer, wines, and spirits. It already is in gin, um, but I said I think those botanicals should stretch a lot further than what you actually see on the back of a gin bottle. Um, looking at other categories, we've got uh, come into play, not just fruits, but leaves, roots, other extracts becoming a lot more popular. Uh, and this reflects quite an interest in, in those ingredients to their particular products. Um, as I said, we've had plenty of questions on CBD and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get back to those people in person. Um, but just at the moment, I think, I think one thing to look at is, uh, is another leaf uh, and that's tea. Um, for me, I think there's a huge amount of potential in tea. Uh, we see it in the soft drinks category, but for the alcoholic drinks category, could be could be pretty important. Um, I believe that consumers have a, a familiarity with tea already. Um, there are health associations with tea, and uh, and particularly people associate that rightly or wrongly with the immune system. Um, there are, of course, very positive claims around uh, compound in tea, which is theanine. Um, so, of course, we'll, we'll have already seen some iced tea hard seltzers coming into the market, and maybe that links me back to the hard seltzer point, um, is that, you know, where next there? Um, certainly, iced tea hard seltzers will, will, um, will appeal to consumers. Maybe why not even add that probiotic to it that we were talking about earlier? Okay. Lovely, lovely. Adam? Um, We've got, a, we've got a couple more minutes, um, but I just wanted to say um, that if we haven't managed to answer your question, because we've had a lot of questions um, coming through and we've tried to group them into um, various categories, um, do, um, you know, do, we will follow Adam will, or myself will follow up with you with you afterwards. Adam, were there any other questions that kind of stood out to you that you wanted to, to, wanted to pick up on? Well, there was one simple one that came in. And when I say simple, I think it's simple to answer, uh, which was do consumers understand ABV or um, alcohol content? Um, I think they do. I, it, personally, I think sometimes it drives the wrong behavior where people will look at um, a, a bottle of whatever it is and then choose it by the fact that it's got the highest ABV. Um, and I think that's the wrong uh, consumer behavior it should be um, driving. Uh, I would say that whilst they do understand the ABV, I, I would sometimes say that some of the communications around what are recommended limits and what are not, are not particularly clear and well communicated and, and consumers don't understand that piece. Okay, um, I've just had, um, I've just had one about um, the mixers, um, mixing drinks as well, kind of, have you got any sort of thoughts on that? Any trends related to that? Um, Okay, so I think I think that's in reference to. Um, are, we, are we talking the about kind of, market? Yeah. Oh, I, oh, I see. I've, I've got you. So, so the, the mixing of drinks. 
Uh, look, people like to experiment. Uh, manufacturers like to experiment uh, and people like to experiment at home as well. Um, I suppose if people are going to start making hard seltzers functional into, into protein drinks, it, I suspect that won't take off. I suspect there'll be some uh, confusion around uh, around what it is. Uh, really, people um, really people consume a lot of these drinks for, for some of the things we were talking about earlier, some uh, celebration, indulgence, uh, being with your friends, uh, or just simple refreshment. Um, I, I don't think there's going to be a huge amount of, uh, of alcoholic protein drinks um, just at the moment, but I'm always happy to be corrected. Oh, Ken, there's one very final question. Do you think that with growing trends towards health that consumers will have adjusted views on sweet and flavour and which traditional low flavour beverages will seem increasingly sweeter or flavourful? Um, yes, I think so. I, I, look, this goes back quite quite some years ago, and I remember sitting in a in a taste conference, believe it or not, when I was so someone was lecturing about the fact that uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, people were eating more and more broccoli, which allows them to become more associate, uh, more used to more more bitter and, in fact, less sweet tastes. People are, are clearly um, associating those sweet tastes with with satiation from a taste perspective, but also uh, not being so healthy. Um, uh, it's quite clear that it's in both consumers' interest and also manufacturers' interest uh, uh, to to move away from those sweet products. Um, and again, you know, I don't mean to go back to it, but if, if you look at some of the products we um, or product concepts we thought about in our study, in the case of hard seltzers, in the case of some of these kombuchas, they do have um, different drivers of taste, whether it's uh, said just lower sweetness or whether it's some acidity. Uh, those are becoming a lot more attractive to consumers than the sweetness um, itself. Does that, I think, I look at, I've got to say, Jenny, we've got a tremendous amount of questions here, and, uh, and thank you very much for, for everyone for listening and staying on so well. I, I think we're running a little bit short on time, Jenny. Uh, is that right? We are. Yes. Yes, yeah. we are. So, okay. Um, so, so just to reiterate, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, what I'll do, um, it gives me a little bit of uh, homework, but I'll probably uh, later on this evening, next couple of weeks, um, I'll have a look at those questions, uh, possibly over a, a beer, uh, and I'll get back to, to those people that are kind enough to send in uh, those questions and, and see what we can do to answer them. Okay. So on that note, uh, Jenny. Thank you so much for your part in this uh, and for all of you listening to this. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe, well, I believe if you keep on asking the questions for, for the next few minutes, uh, we can register them and, and answer them. Uh, and for you, if you'd like to register, there is a, a more detailed report uh, where I hope we can answer some more of your questions. Um, and yeah, please register it and we'll get that out to you. So again, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.